Okay, so let's talk about display here. How, how many of you guys are currently doing advertising at all? Search, search ads, okay. Anybody doing display or native ads of any type? Tried. Tried, didn't work? Okay. How about Facebook? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so let's get into this. Um, so first of all, you know, Tammy gave me a, a brief introduction here, but just so you kind of understand where I'm coming from, here's how I've sort of come to understand display and um, really you know, where my experience lies. So uh, I started doing display advertising in late 2007, and basically since then, it's, it's all I've focused on. So for the last eight years, it's really been my primary sort of focus with uh, advertising and with business. Uh, in 2011, I launched a software uh, product called AdBeat, and uh, AdBeat basically allows you to uh, uncover your any competitor's online display or native ad strategy. Uh, and so, you know, not only have I been sort of involved on the buying side, running display campaigns, but uh, we've created software that tracks what's happening all across the web. Uh, and so I have insight into sort of what's working with display, not just from my own stuff, but from what every other advertiser is doing. Uh, and so just, you know, a, a few screenshots here out of Abby. We can estimate ad spend for an advertiser. We can see what networks they're on. Uh, and we can see what ads are running, how long they've been running, where they're placing those ads, all of that kind of stuff. So it's really easy to sort of break down what works for uh, any advertiser. Uh, so a lot of what I know comes from just sort of studying what's going on. And then as well as I, I'm involved with another company where we're spending a couple million dollars a year uh, on display ads. Uh, and you know, I, so I've been doing that for a while as well on the, on the buying side. Okay, so you know what is display and, and how is it different? Uh, first of all, you, you all are familiar with search marketing. This is often sort of described as intent-based marketing. If someone types in how to start a blog, you're pretty pretty well certain that they're interested in starting a blog, right? Uh, so that's you know why Google is the most valuable company in the world. This is an incredible sort of. Um, an incredible new type of advertising that, that you know, in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, and it's, it's incredibly effective, uh, but it's very different than the types of ads and the sort of targeting and the thought process that goes into making a display campaign work. So display marketing is, um, can sort of be thought of as interruption marketing. So it's, it's actually very similar to sort of the old style advertising, you know, print, print advertising, basically. Um, it's, it's not unlike that at all. Uh, so there's just a lot more data associated with it. And, you know, because of, because of the internet and because of the ability to track what's happening in cookies, um, there's an incredible sort of rich set of data that is available with display that was never available with any other type of interruption marketing before. Uh, and so here's some examples of you know display ads. So it's I, I want to give you a feel for kind of we're not just this is probably this banner ad here uh, is kind of the standard display ad that people think about. There's these standard sizes: 300 by 250, 728 by 90, um, 160 by 600, etc. But I would sort of call anything that sort of falls in this. Uh, this sort of idea of interruption marketing, I would I would kind of classify that as a type of display. So even Facebook ads uh, is is really kind of um, along the same lines. So here's another example: Google AdSense ads. These are text-based ads that show up all across the web. Uh, this is another smaller ad network that shows uh, these little image and, and text ads, sponsored links, uh, Facebook ads, uh, and you'll notice there like that ad format is very similar to this previous ad format. Um, the in-feed ads are very similar to kind of native advertising that's happening all across the web now. So there's a lot of similarities with Facebook. I'm not gonna talk much about Facebook, but um, a lot of what, I'm, what I have to share today is really applicable, I think, to, to that platform as well. Uh, 
mobile ads, whether they're in-app or on the mobile web, that's a type of display. And then finally, uh, ads targeted in an email newsletter. So that's uh, a display ad there served through Live Intent, which is a big um, email uh, display platform. Uh, all of this is, is sort of this idea of interruption marketing. So the display market is really fragmented. It's a lot different than search, uh, where with search, you know, you've got two places to go. You've got Google, you've got Bing. Uh, with social, you know, really Facebook, Twitter, maybe Instagram, Pinterest, some of these new platforms. But it's, you know, you can count them on, on one hand, basically, when you're looking at these other uh, media. Uh, with display, there's there's actually uh, 100 plus uh, ad networks out there, or um, what's called a demand side platform that allows you to access inventory through an exchange. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do, uh, since it seems like you know, for most people, you haven't even got a display campaign to to work yet, I would ask you to focus on the Google Display Network and sort of forget about everything else. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is that there's just um, an incredible amount of scale available with Google Display. So you can go from spending you know, $10 a day to spending uh, $100,000 a day if you have the right offer, the right marketing funnel uh, to, to present to an audience that's that, that's that wide. And the ability to scale you know, from nothing to uh, these you know massive ad spends is um, it's really unparalleled in terms of other platforms. Facebook, I guess you could say Facebook is probably one other place where you can do that. Uh, but I would forget about all the other types of ad networks that you may or may not have, have heard of, and I would just focus on Google Display if you're getting started with Display. If you can make something work on Google Display, then start looking elsewhere and you know seeing where else you might be able to, to buy traffic. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the ads. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about ads and kind of um, the psychology that's happening with, with banner ads. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about targeting uh, and how to think about sort of how to, how to reach your audience. So I'm going to give you some frameworks here uh, that I think if you're starting out, these are, these are really solid places to start. Um, this doesn't mean that every banner ad has these four, these four elements, but if you're starting, um, this is sort of a go-to framework that you can use that uh, is, is proven time and time again to, to produce results. Uh, so a headline, you know, obviously big at the top, a uh, body copy that's gonna get into more about what it is and, and, and build interest. And then a hero shot, uh, and you may have heard this term hero shot, some sort of um, image uh, or illustration that's going to really capture someone's attention if they're on a web page uh, and they're sort of just browsing the web. You gotta remember that you know, these, the, the, your prospects that are out there uh, that you're trying to reach through display, they, they aren't thinking about your offer, right? They're not thinking about your solution. They're not even thinking about Often they're not necessarily thinking about the problem that that you may solve for them, right? It may sort of be there. There may be like a, a latent demand for that. Like they may have sort of this in the back of their mind. They know they have this this problem, but they're not actively. It's not in their conscious thought at that moment, right? They're not. If if it was, they might be trying to solve it by going to the search, you know, going to going to Google search and starting to type things in, right? So you have to really catch someone's attention. And so display advertising tends to be more, um, a little more sort of in your face and um, aggressive, I would say, when it, when it works well. Uh, versus like a search ad, um, often you know, just telling someone you're gonna solve the problem that they just typed in is enough. You don't have to get you know, necessarily super creative. And in fact, Google does all these things to make it next to impossible to get too creative because um, you know you can't you can't put if you don't have the words from the search in your ad your your quality score is going to be terrible so there's a lot of limitations with search you don't have that with a banner ad you, you're also not limited by ad copy you're not limited by you know how many words you can write 
um, how long the headline can be. So there's a lot more flexibility. And that's, that's great in a lot of ways, but it's also, um, it's also a little bit tricky. So it helps to kind of have, um, have sort of an idea of you know, what, what's a good framework to work with. So the last thing here is the, uh, the call to action. Uh, some sort of a button or a link that is going to really kind of um, drive, that, drive that click for them to learn more or you know, solve the problem. Okay, here's, a, here's another formula that I think is really helpful. Uh, this is known as the ADA formula. It's like, this is 100 plus years old. This again, like originated with print advertising. And the idea here is that you wanna first capture attention then develop uh, interest, finally a desire for what it is that you're offering, and then get someone to take action. And you can actually apply this formula throughout the, the marketing funnel. So you can apply this to a banner ad that's gonna get somebody to, to click, and then you can apply it to the landing page that they land on, right? And you may, maybe you're going for an opt-in, right? And you're gonna market to them over time after that opt-in and then you can apply that to the full email funnel that you've built out, right? So kind of um, this, can, this can be sort of applied all, all the way through the marketing funnel. But for a banner ad, again, every banner ad doesn't necessarily follow this, this sort of a formula, but it's an easy one to kind of start with, and uh, it's, it's going to get you some pretty good results. So this ad here just happens to follow this formula near, near exactly so I would say that, you know, finally and the golfer are really the attention here. That finally in those big sort of block uh, letters is really attention grabbing. The golfer, if I'm a golfer and I'm browsing the web and I'm on a, a news site or a technology site or whatever, I may not be thinking about golf, but as soon as I see that golfer, I'm recognizing, okay, this ad is like, is something for me, right? And so that's gonna draw the attention in. And then the next line is the, the serious amateur golfer has a golf swing of his very own. So now that's starting to build interest because I'm thinking, okay, this ad may be actually really, really speaking to me. Like I'm an amateur golfer. Uh, you know, this is something that's interesting to me specifically. So I'm starting to build more interest now that I realize this is a golf ad. And then the final, or the next, the next piece here, desire, get longer tee shots, more control than ever before. That is the real desire. So what do I want as an amateur golfer? I want longer tee shots. I want more control, right? And then finally, action, that's the, the big click here button. So this is a really sort of nice example of how this formula can be followed. Um, again, every ad doesn't necessarily follow this sort of formula. And I'm gonna, Here's some examples, actually, of some ads that you know, don't necessarily follow that formula exactly. Uh, but these are good ads uh, nonetheless. And I should mention, actually, that so the reason the ads that I'm putting in this presentation, the reason they're showing up here is because we're tracking all of these ads with AdBeat, and I'm selecting ads that I know are, are working well, right? So I'm not guessing about this. I'm not you know, trying to sort of look at this from first principles and say, oh, this is, this is a good ad because of this, this, or this. We know that these ads are actually performing well. And so that's why I've kind of put them in here to, to talk about. Uh, so here's, here's some examples of other banner ads. And um, to give you like a feel for what else, sort of other things that are out there and, and, and how other ads might look, this, the PDF creator ad uh, with the big download button I think that one works so well just because it's super simple, the huge download button, and it's very clear what this is. Um, you either you know, know that you want a PDF creator or you don't, and this is just telling you, you know, very simply, here's, here's how to get it, right? This heart attack ad, the copy here is, uh, is just, um, I think it's, it's really compelling. If you're of an age where maybe you're thinking about the possibility of a heart attack, you've had family members had a heart attack. Uh, these four things happen right before a heart attack. I don't, I, that's to me, like, I don't know what those, thing, those things are. I probably wanna, you know, check this out and see what this is about, right? And the purpose of the ad is really just to get that click. You wanna try to qualify the, 
you want to try to qualify the person so you can't, you don't want to trick them or into clicking or something like that because then they're not going to be qualified when they hit the page. But you want to really sort of build some curiosity and get that click and then the purpose of the landing page is to get the next action and, and so on through the marketing funnel. Uh, this, this ad here, the, the, the third ad over is uh, by Motley Fool. They're an investment site, investment newsletter type of business. Uh, that ad is going to show up on news websites, on investing sites. The types of people that are going to be on those sites are used to reading news articles. This ad looks very much like it might be a news article. And that's going to cause people to you know, look at that ad, get interested, and, and click through. The, the Bellroy ad at the bottom here, Bellroy is a wallet manufacturer. And they've been incredibly successful at selling wallets on display advertising. And to me, that's, that's sort of incredible. They're actually they're, they're like the only wallet manufacturer I've ever seen that's using display advertising effectively. But when you can sell something that is available at any department store, in any town, in any city, through display ads, you're doing something right. Like there's, there's um, there's, it, it's, it's pretty difficult to actually be able to spend that money to, to, to get people to click on these ads and convert them. So particularly for a product that's just available anywhere or you know, I don't know where, where if Bellroy is available in stores or whatever, but a wallet is available anywhere, right? But what they're doing here with this ad is I think genius and I first found out about Bellroy because I saw one of these ads and I immediately wanted to click on it because if you're a guy and you see this ad, I think you immediately sort of recognize the problem that they're claiming that they solve. And you immediately are interested because it's you know, a pain to be sitting on a big fat wallet and you know, this idea of having this slim wallet is, is really, you know, it's really appealing, right? And so just sort of that demonstration in the ad itself is, is enough to really generate that interest and get people to click through and see what this Bellroy Slim wallet is all about. Their landing page is also incredible. I'm not going um, to get into that in this presentation, but if you go to their site, I think you'll, start, you'll see probably some of their landing pages. And uh, it's, really, it's really incredible the way that they sort of bring you into this funnel uh, and, and, and bring you through to a purchase decision. And then finally, this ad here, this last one is about uh, a business plan, uh, like a business plan kit, like a how to write a business plan sort of a thing. And I think this ad works well just because, uh, just because it's, um, it's really different and it kind of you know, comes off the page. It's handwritten. That's one of the things handwritten ads can work really well. So I think that's really what's making that ad work. All right. So a little bit more about kind of strategies when you're creating ads. So you want to either blend in or stick out. Like the middle there is not a great place to be. So if you're blending in, people will start reading the ad before they realize it's an ad. And really, you know, most of the battle is actually getting somebody to pay attention to your ad to begin with, right? And so if somebody is already reading the ad before they really realize that it's an ad, then you're, you know, that, that's probably going to do well because you've captured so much more attention on the advertisement already. So that's one strategy is to kind of blend in. Uh, and you'll see this um, all over the place. If you find a site that's a really good match for your audience, it can be, um, it can be cost effective to, uh, to really think about creating ads specifically for that site. So that's one way that successful advertisers will make, um, will make, will make the, the cost of the advertising work uh, by actually tailoring individual ads to individual sites. The other, the other option is to stick out. And so uh, basically create, how many of you guys are familiar with lower my bills? They're, they're the, the sort of king of this sort of, um, really annoying kind of uh, ads that just, they used to be plastered all over the internet. Um, they're not so much anymore. Um, but uh, back when like the, 
housing bubble was sort of happening and mortgages were big, that's kind of their business. Uh, these ads were just everywhere. Uh, and they, they're just, they're so sort of um, in your face that it's impossible not to, to look at the ad basically. So think about sort of um, those two strategies. What you really don't wanna be is just sort of somewhere in the middle. People don't really care uh, when you're in the middle. All right, some other things about what makes ads work. Uh, selector images can be good. So these, these sort of age brackets here, anytime that you can, if this is a strategy that makes sense for, for your product or service, uh, anytime somebody can sort of see themselves in the ad, like they can say, oh, that's me, I'm in that group right there, that's, that's a good thing because it's kind of, it's generating that interest and it's making them think that, hey, there's something that's kind of specific for me on the other side of that ad. Uh, and the second thing about this ad that I want to point out is just this, this woman who's showing emotion. Uh, any type of emotion in the ad, whether it's you know, surprise, uh, fear, um, sorrow, I mean, it, basically emotion uh, is going to be good because that, we're trained to sort of recognize emotion. So if you're kind of browsing the web and you know, you're looking at you know, a web page and you're just reading articles, if you see somebody that's somehow in distress or excited or whatever in an ad, that's going to capture your attention. So Lower My Bills does a lot of that as well. Uh, using women in ads as kind of the hero shot, this is, you know, this is a strategy that works in basically all types of advertising. It works in banner advertising too. Uh, bigger images, so you want a, a, an image of a person to be you know, sizable. The bigger that you can get it in the ad, generally that's gonna be, that's gonna be better. Eyes looking out at you uh, is, is generally gonna, gonna get a better click-through rate. Uh, you can also test eyes looking at the call to action. Uh, either of those is kind of, kind of, those are the most likely things to work. All right, hand-drawn ads I mentioned before. Uh, these ads, they, you know, they're ugly. They, they get uh, incredible results. Uh, often very high click-through rates. Uh, they convert well. That's why you'll see this stuff all over the web. All right, so here's an example um, of two different advertisers you know, taking very different approaches with display. Um, this is in the home security market. Vivint uh, is a $2 billion company. They, they sold uh, to Blackstone a couple years ago for $2 billion. ADT is a public company, is a $4 billion company. On the left here, you'll see the ADT and the Vivint ad. These are terrible display ads. Um, if you're a multi-billion dollar company, you can probably afford to make ads like that. And, uh, and if the, the spend doesn't back out for you, it's, you know, it's probably not a huge deal. If you're a smaller company and you're looking to sort of you know, get a foothold in, in a market, you need to be a little bit more creative. There's this company called Simply Safe uh, that entered the home security market, um, I don't know how many years ago, six, seven years ago, I'm thinking maybe. Uh, they didn't, they, there's, there's not a lot of press out there on them. Uh, in fact, the last article I saw on them was an article about how there's no articles about them anywhere. Um, yet, they're currently a $100 million uh, annual run rate company, and they just uh, got their first venture round from Sequoia uh, a few months back for $57 million, their first round. Um, what they did was they came into this market dominated by these billion dollar players, and they really effectively use display advertising to acquire customers for their home security uh, offering. And these, just this is to give you an idea, this isn't like all the ads that they use, but this is to give you an idea of sort of like how they're competing against bigger players. These ads here were shown you know, on sites where there's a lot of parents, right? Ba baby center, cafe mom, uh, sites like that where there's you know either expecting mothers and fathers or 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 parents and I mean if you look at these ads until you get to the bottom you don't even know this is about a security offering right and so what they've done here is they've basically taken you know what did, what is it that these people who you're putting this ad in front of what do they care about they care about their children that's sort of like top of mind for them they're on a site about children about babies uh, and it's a huge life event, so that's sort of like everything that they're thinking about. 
they've created these ads to generate that attention instantly because not only is the, are the ads about you know, babies, but they're about this nightmare situation that uh, you know, might happen right if you don't get a security system. So this, this sort of advertising is what um, allowed Simply Safe to really come into a, an established market and do incredibly well with an online customer acquisition strategy. Uh, they've, they've just done incredibly well with, with their whole strategy. I've got to think another ad from Simply Safe um, later on to kind of give you an idea of, of some of their other creative. Okay, so bottom line with images is um, just test and test again and test again. On average, I would say there's a two to three times uh, increase in click-through rate from images alone. So you can double or triple the response of an ad just by changing out the image that you use in that ad. All right, a little bit more about kind of some psychology uh, with these ads. Uh, Keep the, uh, this, is, this is a quote from an old time you know, advertising guy uh, by the name of Robert Collier. And the quote is, enter the conversation in the prospect's mind. That's what you're trying to do with interruption marketing because you, you're, you're most likely to capture their attention if you're speaking to something that's sort of like already kind of in the back of their mind, right? And this ad here by AppSumo, uh, I don't, they, they ran this a number of years ago. Uh, and I think it's a fantastic ad. It really sort of, I think, plays to this idea where uh, they're, they're selling courses and information and um, products about how to start a business, right? And so most of the people that are interested in those sorts of things are, they've wanted to start a business for a long time. They don't have a successful business yet. They're probably sort of frustrated with that uh, and they're probably um, kind of you know, wishing that they could do something about that. They don't necessarily know what to do. Uh, this ad speaks to that sort of mindset and in a really attention-grabbing way. I mean, you put kill in the middle of an ad with blood splatter all over it, you, people are going to pay attention to that ad, right? Uh, and then the messaging is also about like killing that sort of procrastination process, that you know, not taking action that's happening and actually, you know, moving forward and starting your business. So it's really compelling for this market and I think that's why this works well. All right, so uh, congruency with the landing page. So I'm not really gonna talk much about landing pages today, but the landing page is just as essential to an effective display strategy as the ads, right, and the targeting. Uh, the targeting is the other thing. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Um, but here's an example of a landing page that is congruent with the ad. So this is always something to keep in mind. Uh, you know, you want the landing page to sort of have um, what's been described as like the, the scent of the ad, right? So here they use the same image so that when somebody clicks on that ad, they hit the landing page and they sort of, they, they, they feel comfortable, this is something I'm interested in, because they just clicked on something that looks exactly like that, right? Uh, if you presented a completely different design here that looks nothing like the ad, that's gonna be, that's gonna be a little bit of a disconnect, and it's gonna affect you know, the, the conversion rate of that page. All right, keep this in mind, fear of loss is stronger than the desire for gain, so uh, if you can position a, a free report or um, a free tool or whatever it is that you're selling or, or even your product in general in a way that sort of speaks to that fear of loss rather than uh, the desire for gain. So the, the negative rather than the positive often will work better. I would, you know, I would say test this, but be cognizant of what you're offering to people. Are you offering you know, seven tips to increase this, or are you offering, you know, five mistakes to avoid to make sure this doesn't happen with whatever, right? And come up with, that one thing you might want to test is, you know, test both of those, the, the, both the positive and the negative, but if I had to pick one, my bet would be on the, the fear of loss, right? All right, curiosity and entertainment is, is sort of big in banner ads. Again, you're trying to really capture attention. So anytime within the ad that you can sort of um, 
create something that, that has a little bit of entertainment value, uh, I think that's a good thing. Uh, this ad here, um, it's got all these little ants and the banana's got, you know, some emotion going on and everything. It's, uh, if you see this ad on a page, you're gonna pay attention to it, right? Uh, and the same thing with landing pages, I think with display, it's often, um, it's often good to sort of provide a little bit of entertainment value in a way on the landing page because you gotta remember that these people were not actively seeking out your, your solution, right? Or a solution to their problem. They, uh, they're, they're not actively seeking it out. And so they, you, you caught them with the ad, right? So you caught their attention with the ad, uh, but you have to keep that attention on the landing page. So with, with search, it's not so much about the attention. They're already thinking about that problem. But with display, uh, you really have to keep that attention, I think, more so on the landing page. Keep them interested enough to want to stay there because they may have just clicked that ad because it caught their interest briefly. Uh, so the page really needs to also capture that attention. Video works pretty well for that. Uh, video is a little more time intensive, cost intensive to make it work right, but it, it works really well for that. Okay, uh, another idea here is like calling out a common enemy in your ad. So this is Simply Safe again. Uh, basically, there's a story here. There's two things about this ad that make it work. It's a personal story about how the founder uh, realized there was this problem in the home security market. Uh, and basically the enemy is these companies like ADT that lock you into three-year contracts. And this is the story that's told in this ad. And you know, if you've ever signed up for a, a ADT contract and wished you could get out of it later, this ad is really gonna speak to you. Okay, so for banner creation, I'm gonna show you what my workflow is, just to give you an idea of sort of how, how this works and how you can eventually end up with you know, one or two really solid banner ads. So what I do is I write copy in Excel, uh, and I write that so that it, it's within the Google Display uh, Network guidelines for text ad copy. Uh, and I'll write that copy, I'll start testing with text ads. Uh, so I'll write 20 to 30 ads, I'll pick four to eight to begin testing, depending on how much of your bu how much budget you have. If you have less budget, go with less ads, maybe four to start. More budget, go ahead, throw in a few more variations. It'll take you longer time to reach a decision on which ad is working, the more ads you put in. So the budget's a little bit of a factor there. But the big thing is here, you know, write 20 or 30 ads. Um, how, have any of you seen that PDF for a presentation going around about how Upworthy writes headlines? Yeah? Okay, so this is the same idea here, right? You, you can't expect to go just sit down and write an ad or two and have it work. You need to write 20, 30 ads, or write as many as you possibly can. 20 or 30 is pretty good. Then read back over those and look at the ones that really pop to you, like what, what really stands out as like something that's gonna catch attention. Choose four to eight of those and begin testing with text ads only. That's what, that's what I would recommend on Google Display. What you're testing for there is copy before you're investing a bunch of money into and time into getting banner ads created. Um, you, could, you could go with Google Display Ad Builder and, and sort of get some stuff created very simply there, but I wouldn't really recommend that. I'd recommend starting with text ads. Uh, so you, what you wanna do is test like for these ads. You choose a winner with the text ads only. Uh, so this blue ad here is the winner. Then you wanna take that and sort of translate that copy into kind of one of those ad formats that we went over earlier, uh, and then test different images with the banner ads, right? And then you know, start with four different images, test those. So now you're testing proven copy with unproven images, and you're looking for an image that's really gonna work. So the combination of going through this, um, this sort of copy first, then images, uh, and then later, if you, if you really wanted to kind of you know, invest more money into that later, if you've got a designer that you can work with, um, I would recommend using a competitive intelligence tool like AdBeat, figure out the best ads that are out there that are performing, uh, show the designer, hey, these, I want ads that sort of look like this, right? 
Send them the copy that you've already figured out. Uh, send them ideas for illustrations or images. It's a big thing here. Like you can't just ask a designer to create ads and expect them to work. Like you need to really direct the process based on a lot of the stuff we talked about uh, in this 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 presentation here. And if you have access to competitive intelligence data like AdBeat, based on your knowledge of what's already working, but a designer is never going to. It's like a, I mean, total shot in the dark if, if for the designer to produce something that's going to work for you, right? So you need to kind of direct that whole process. Um, and then provide feedback to that designer based on data. So test those ads. You say, look, let's go with more of this style because it seems to be kind of working better, that sort of thing. All right, I want to talk about targeting here for a few slides. And then uh, I think we'll wrap up and hopefully have some time for questions. So when you're targeting display ads, and again, I'm, I'm mostly speaking about the, the Google Display Network here, although a lot of this applies to, to Facebook as well. Uh, these are some of the factors that you sort of have at your disposal, uh, along with some others like, um, well, a lot, of it, a lot of the others are sort of wrapped into this bottom psychographics where the placements that you're showing up on, the websites that you're showing up on, what you're really doing with targeting a website is you're targeting sort of a mindset uh, and a type of audience that has certain beliefs and behaviors for them to be on that site. Like those, those Simply Safe ads I showed earlier, targeting like Baby Center or Cafe Mom, um, they're targeting a site, but they're targeting a specific set of psychographics, right? So that, that sort of encompasses a lot of different things. Starting at the top here, though, these are like your basic targeting factors that you go into Google, and these are the things you can control in your account. Um, there's not really, there's, well, psychographics are a little more difficult. Like, that's kind of up to you to, to, to come up with, you know, who your audience is, and they're not necessarily, like, as cut and dry as some of these other factors. But geographic, demographic, day of week, time, device type, these are all just settings in your campaign. They're very easy to sort of choose. And what I'm going to do is give you a feel for if you've never done this stuff before, I think that these numbers um, might be surprising. I, I think they were surprising to me when I started really understanding all this stuff. But what I'm going to show you here is kind of just an estimate of how powerful these factors are, meaning like how, how much you can swing the conversion rate or the, the cost per acquisition of a customer, or the cost per lead for that customer, right? So geographic targeting, easily 200% or more uh, difference. This can be much, much higher than this. I mean, imagine if you're selling uh, solar panels, right? I, I, I can guarantee you if you're advertising that offer to Manhattan zip codes, it's gonna perform really poorly, right? because people living in high rises don't want solar panels. They might still click on the ads, but they, they don't want solar panels, right? They're not gonna buy solar panels. So that's an example where geographic can be huge. It can be just absolutely you know, enormous, but on more, on more sort of offers that could apply to people anywhere, I would still place this factor at at least 200%. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the socioeconomic sort of um, tie in with geography, right? So you target a zip code, what you're really targeting is an income, right? Uh, and you're targeting other sorts of psychographic factors that, that are sort of held within that zip code. Uh, so ge geography is um, sort of, there's bleed into other sorts of ideas with targeting. Uh, demographic targeting, male or female, depending on your offer, of course, can be can be hugely uh, can be hugely impactful. Day of week, easily 50% difference. If it's a B2B offering, you probably want to start uh, only offering showing your ads Monday through Friday. Same thing with time of day. You might want to limit them limit your ads to business hours. And the reason what I want you to sort of take away from this slide is what what you want to do to try to make a display campaign successful. What I would recommend is you start trying to nail some of these factors just thinking about your audience, right? And start trying to think, you know, where is my audience most likely to respond? What, 
what geographies, what day of the week, what time of the day. And I would start your campaign sort of narrowly focused on the, the, those targeting factors that you think is most likely to work. And if you can make it work there, then you want to start relaxing some of those targeting factors and seeing if you can achieve higher volumes at acceptable cost per acquisition, right? Um, if you start too broad, what most people will get scared away from display because they, you lose money, right, at first until it's working. And you're losing money because you're showing your ads to a lot of people that aren't really a good fit at times of day that aren't really a good fit, geographies that aren't a good fit, all of that. And so you'll get scared away from it as a channel um, if you don't try to sort of nail some of this down before you even start, right? Uh, let's see, device is huge. I mean, depending on what device they're on, it can, it can you know, 200% easy. Uh, and then finally, psychographics. Uh, I want to talk a bit more about this. And that's sort of the interest, beliefs, and behaviors uh, for your audience. So here's what you want to think about when you're thinking about not only you know, how do you create your ads, how do you create your landing page, what offer do you want to give them if it's a, if it's a lead generation type offer, um, what, you know, all, everything about what copy you want to write, but also about your targeting. What sites are you going to try to reach these, these customers on, right? Um, what interest targets are you going to experiment with in Google? What keywords are you going to put into Google uh, so that you're showing ads that, where people are reading about these sorts of keywords, right? So ask these kinds of questions and really try to develop a customer profile for who you think is going to be a good fit um, for your offer. So are they successful or struggling financially? Uh, do they, what do they value? Family, money, achievement? Uh, what sites are they likely to be on, right? Um, these aren't sites that are related specifically to your offer. So make sure that you're thinking kind of broader than that. You, what you want to be thinking is, you know, where, what other sites might they visit that aren't necessarily about specifically my, my market, right, or my offer? What are their beliefs, uh, opinions, prejudices, uh, and recent events? Recent events is, you know, the Simply Safe example with the baby ads is a prime example there. All right, here's some other questions. You know, what are their hobbies? What TV shows do they watch? Authority figures? Um, what books do they read? Where do they shop? Are they involved with groups, associations? Uh, and, and what are their specific pain points? What you want to do is answer all these questions, get a feel for really you know, who this person is that you're trying to reach, come up with keywords and targeting criteria um, where you might be able to reach these types of people. Uh, my, I can tell you my display campaigns, they don't, the, tar, the, the keywords that we use to, to reach converting, converting uh, clicks often have absolutely nothing to do with the offer at all. Like it, it's, it's just completely um, outside of, of the, the specific sort of market that, that we're advertising. Um, and it's because there's just crossover. There's certain things that um, there's groups of interest that kind of have overlap with, with, other, with other factors, right? And so that's what you're looking for. This is how you can really scale something up. Uh, if you have an offer that is, you know, widely appealing, um, this, is, this is the kind of process you want to go through to figure out how to scale that out. All right. So that's all I've got.